second. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you for joining us for the final panel of the day at this, the 15th anniversary of ITW. It's my pleasure to welcome you, and I hope you'd had a busy and fruitful time reconnecting with all parts of the industry today. Next up, we have a panel discussion delivering on the potential of 5G, which is part of the Future Networks track. Before we begin, though, I'd like to thank all of our sponsors, specifically our diamond sponsors, AT&T, Deutsche Telekom, STC, and Telefonica for making this all possible. So joining us now is a fantastic group of speakers, including our moderator for the panel, Alan Burkett Gray, editor at large here at Capacity Media. So without further ado, over to you, Alan, and the rest of the panel. Great. Sit down, please, all of you. Uh, before, when, when we start, um, and thank you all for coming, for I know it's the last day and you're probably tired, and uh, last presentation, you're all tired and you have evening things to look forward to, but thank you very much indeed. I mean, since the last ITW, which was 2019, I think 5G has emerged from a concept into a reality. Um, certainly on my phone, uh, I get, not here because it's roaming, but I get 5G at home um, in the UK. So um, I'm going to ask everyone in order from my left down the, down the line to uh, say a little bit about what they think is the potential of 5G and what their particular companies have going to do with it, have to do with it. So Nicholas from Deutsche Telekom, please. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, Nicholas Nikura from uh, Deutsche Telekom Global Carrier. Uh, my areas of responsibility within the organization is uh, voice uh, messaging, mobile solutions, and uh, cloud communication solutions. And of course, 5G being part of the, uh, part of the mobile solutions for us. Um, with respect to how, I mean, we have two hats within Deutsche Telekom Team Mobile Group. Uh, one being as a mobile operator right now looking at standardization within the GSMA working group, of course, making sure that we are part of that uh, environment. Um, uh, so by towards the end of this year, hopefully that standardization on a lot of aspects of it, especially the security part of it would be finished. And the other part being as a wholesale solution provider uh, to make sure that we are, we understand exactly what it means from a wholesale yeah. perspective. We understand what is the requirements from an IPX provider. We are one of the largest IPX providers in the world to the mobile uh, ecosystem to understand how the security aspects of 5G are going to impact the way we provide the solution, to better understand how we can provide the value-added services when it comes to roaming value-added services, because they are going to be completely different than what we have done so far on 2G, 3G, and 4G, um, and to make sure that the we continue to create an environment where the customer experience yep. uh, is optimal and also the interoperability amongst, again, between various uh, parts of the network, again, mm. 2G, 3G, 4G, to 5G, non-standalone and therefore standalone, are as seamless as possible for the mobile operators. Okay. Thank you, Jonathan of uh, Naturality. Hi, uh, Jonathan Martone. So I run interconnection and network solutions for Neutrality data centers. And uh, we are a carrier hotel data center operator. We own and operate our data center assets in uh, Indianapolis, Kansas City, St. Louis, Houston, Philadelphia, Chicago. So essentially, we're edge computing. We enable carriers, cable providers, uh, CDNs, internet exchanges, and now 5G um, providers, uh, the edge capabilities uh, that we bring to the table. So we reduce latency. We reduce geography for all of the above, and you know, our, our focus is to help all those, those assets uh, provide additional nice performance, low latency, um, and, and, and help those carriers uh, exchange internet traffic or ultra long haul traffic uh, to uh, accentuate performance for our constituents. Thank you. Yeah, uh, James, you go next and introduce yourself. And sure. Uh, my name is James Kimmery. I'm the Vice President of uh, Product Management for the Lifecycle Service Assurance Business Unit at Spirit Communications. Uh, I feel a little lonely because I'm, I think I'm the only test and measurement person at this conference. <laughs> <clears throat> Maybe not. I'm sure uh, there must be one or two others. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, 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 I haven't run them. into If anybody. I spot them, I'll say, go and talk to James. <laughs> But, uh, you know, we, at Spirit, we, we work on uh, testing 
mobile infrastructure, core network, uh, 5G. We've been, uh, we are, most of our partners are the uh, top service operators in the world. Uh, we've been closely involved uh, with the uh, 5G rollouts worldwide. Mm -hmm. Also, just to, just to note, in terms of, you know, testing, we do both uh, testing, which is in the lab, <clears throat> the pre-deployment stage, uh, but also we do the uh, service assurance when it's when it's deployed, and one of the challenges that that uh, most of our customers, are, are our partners are encountering is 5G is is just quite different in terms of the prior generations of cellular standards, uh, because 5G is um, is intended to address use cases that the prior generation of standards uh, never even comprehended. And so what that means is that there's an additional testing assurance capability that's necessary for different service level agreements to enable these 5G capabilities. Thanks. Ray, Ray Lachance. Thank you. Um, I'm Ray Lachance, uh, co-founder and CEO of Zenfi Networks. Zenfi is a, um, a mobile infrastructure uh, provider based in the New York Metro. We, we deliver fiber optic networks, edge co-location, and uh, wireless lighting solutions. And we've been, um, we've, we've been focused on the 5G um, uh, air, air area for the past, you know, three, four years getting ready for ultra densification. You know, the promise of 5G to deliver high-speed high connectivity at low, lower latencies with quality of service and class of services uh, controls is, uh, is a, uh, a big undertaking, and it requires a special type of network. And, and the, the networks of the past um, weren't built to support this, this requirement. So to deliver low latency you need, and, and high capacity, you need ultra density. And the, the focus of Zenfi in, in our region has been building ultra-dense networks over the past. Uh, we started about seven years ago focused on this and started with dense 4G networks and we've evolved to uh, ultra-dense 5G networks. <coughs> Thank you. Um, well, actually, one of the interesting things you said just now, James, was that uh, 5G is being built for specific applications in mind and with the previous generations, they sort of emerged you know, things, that's, there wasn't a Spotify before there was 4G, there wasn't uh, picture messaging before there was 3G, they, and there wasn't SMS, of course, before there was 2G. They all came about because people played with them and said, oh, we can do that. What's going to be, what are the specific things that 5G can do uh, in terms of secure applications, health services, or whatever, that 2G, 3G, 4G haven't been able to do? You go first, James, and then maybe Nicholas and... Ray and Jonathan, yeah. Sure, uh, yeah, I mean, 5G, uh, the 3GPP standard, it's really the first wireless standard ever to address latency. And latency is important for many different applications. I think, I think many that have survived the COVID uh, pandemic would say that latency is also pretty critical for video conferencing. Uh, <laughs> but latency is, uh, is also very important for AR, VR types of applications, uh, Vita X, uh, and, you know, and, and just many more gaming. So th that's, that's one of the, the, the key things uh, that are, are key, I guess, characteristics that, you know, com companies want to be able to test and make sure that their network is performing to a certain level of latency and some sort of service level agreement or SLA so that they can mon monetize that capability uh, in their network. Yeah. Yes, Nicholas. Uh, from a mobile operator perspective, besides what James mentioned about latency, uh, I look at it from a tri triangular perspective uh, when it comes to 5G. Because 5G, first of all, is the, on the first, uh, you know, environment where security is embedded in it. 4G, right. 3G, 2G, it, it's, it's not the case. It has not been the case. So end-to-end -end security, end-to-end -end encryption, um, and, and, and that part of it is paramount when it yeah. comes to 5G. The other part of it, of course, is the fact that it's, it's cloud-native. 
mm. and the other ones have not been cloud native. So from that perspective also in terms of how the infrastructure works and how we're going to put that together is, is, a, is, a, different, is, a, is a different model. Um, and when you mentioned 2G, 3G, 4G, um, I think my opinion is this is the first time we go from uh, customer uh, quality of service to quality of experience. Right. I think from a mobile operator's perspective, we have missed that part. I think the OTTs have done a fantastic job in terms of creating quality of experience for the customer base. We as mobile operators were behind, and 5G I think gives us that opportunity to really create quality of experience for the customer. Again, I'm looking at it not only from a national perspective, I come from a roaming in environment, so it's international roaming yeah. activities. Again, those three areas for, uh, for us, are, and, and, and when you discuss it throughout the GSMA discussions, are really, really paramount in, right. in pushing 5G out. Thank you. Jonathan. Yeah, that was a good point, yeah, to build on that quality of experience. So what we do with our mobile operator partners is help them. So from a latency perspective, there's only two ways to reduce latency, right? It's increase the speed of light or reduce geography. And I don't think anybody has increased the speed of light yet. Hopefully Elon's working on that, but uh, <laughs> I don't think even he so, can do it. No. Until we get to that point, so we, we need to reduce geography. And, and what the mobile operators are doing is they're leveraging edge data centers like Neutrality, for example, in Houston, aggregating all that traffic locally in that central business district, as opposed to backhauling it to Dallas to peer or to exchange with Netflix or another peering fabric. Once that traffic stays localized, the customer has a better experience, right, from a 5G perspective on their phone, whether they're streaming Netflix, they're on Meta, they're Web 3.0, et cetera. So it, it, it really helps their applications, and it also reduces uh, optimization and uh, transport costs on their end by keeping that traffic localized. So that's what we're yep. in the business of doing, is improving people's lives and experiences. Good point. Ray, what do you, how do you see it? So when, when you look at the, uh, the five things that five, the 5G technologies uh, will deliver, you know, high speeds at ultra low latencies with class of service and quality of service controls in a highly secure environment, it, 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 if, if the, you know, without getting specific about applications and the potential of applications, think of what can be done with that infrastructure that couldn't be done in a, uh, in a, in a uh, uh, 4G infrastructure or 3G infrastructure where there were just completely uh, disconnected layers for all of those things. The quality service, class of service um, wasn't done through, through the, 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 the network infrastructure. It was done separately as an overlay. So with all these integrated features, there's, you know, network slicing is going to enable us to have, um, you know, real-time services all the way down to you know once once a month or once a minute or one, once an hour services right mm -hmm. we'll have different mm -hmm. classes of services that are enabled and these are new new products that can be uh, you, you know exploited by the the operators or, or offered by the operators there's new application opportunities it just creates a whole new world of of development before we had 4g we didn't have uber Right, and, and, and we do. It took it took 4G to enable those type of apps. So if you use your imagination, the your wildest dreams, uh, you know, will will uh, will, will be available uh, to us in, in the future. Okay, thank you. Now, you mentioned uh, Jonathan. I think it was that 5G is cloud native. That's really key. What difference does that make? And let's move on from there to why is 5G apparently much more complex than previous Gs. <laughs> uh, um, and why does that make things so different um, for how we address the opportunities from 5G? Do you want to go first, Jonathan, carry on and then? I mean, from a, you know, from a technical standpoint, you know, it's, it's more of a software-defined network that you have to manage. Yeah. So there's a little bit of lift and shift from an MNO standpoint. I yeah. don't want to comment too much on what the MNOs do, but you know, from a data center perspective, migrating from traditional TDM to ultra long haul to SDN um, mm. via SASE and other security services is, is a little arduous of a task. So it yeah. just takes more, more time and more training for the, for the MNOs to uh, uh, bring their, their, their folks and infrastructure up to speed. And obviously with supply chain and upgrading switches and, and other equipment, uh, you know, there are some delays, but I, I, I think 
at least in the states, um, the MNOs have done a good job getting 5G to the central business districts and they're optimizing network pretty well. I guess they're going to be, the MNOs are going to be running four networks, four different standards at the same time. Mm -hmm. well, I mean, well, some of them are yeah. throwing out 3G and I, I got a message today that 3 in the UK, which is owned by CK Hutchison, that's closing down its 3G network. Uh, after, what was it, 2003 it started. It started on 3 3 2003. Uh, remember that. Um, yeah. So nearly 20 years ago. <laughs> it's survived a long time. But there's still 2G and there's still 4G. Yeah, and that's a really good point because as more people consume 5G, it actually helps people in the rural areas that don't have 5G infrastructure in place to have a better experience leveraging 4G LTE. Because there's fewer services. people on that's those. Yeah, yeah. Yes, Nicholas. I mean, uh, just to. Uh, Touch on your last point here. I think that's one of the areas that, again, I, I mentioned at the beginning. I, in my my part of the organization, we wear two hats: one from a mobile perspective as a T-Mobile, and yeah. the other one from a, 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 a Deutsche Telekom Global Carrier. Uh, I think that's where companies like Global Carrier bring a lot of value into the ecosystem because, again, the handoff per activities. Uh, the seamless experience of the customer. Again, I'm talking about roaming activities here. Yeah, uh, international roaming. You're going to have to roam the, the 3G seamless part to of 5G it. networks Absolutely. And, and, and vice versa. Yes, yeah. I, uh, <laughs> I remember once I read that in order to uh, in order for a mobile operator to to go through all of their uh, aspects of m moving all of their contracts from 3G to 4G it takes about 20 man years of activity, commercial negotiation, and all of that and so forth. And and we bring value into that ecosystem that. Oh, Basically, uh, maybe, I would say overnight, but maybe it will take a couple of days or a couple of weeks, <laughs> but it's not really overnight. But we can create that seamless experience for the customers. Um, you know, where, no matter where, uh, what, what network they're on, no matter what technology they're using on their phone, and no matter what part of the world they're traveling to. So I think that's the value that Deutsche Telekom Global Carrier brings into this ecosystem, and we've been doing this for 20 years now. Um, uh, from, a, uh, from the other aspect, part of it, again, as a mobile operator, and again, this is a huge discussion point right now uh, within GSMA, and, and as I said at the beginning, we are part of that standardization process, is the way we manage the security end-to-end. -end. Mm. Because it's completely different than the way 3G, 4G, and, and, and 2G have worked. Um, some larger operators, for instance, are very keen in doing all of this end-to-end -end themselves. But again, when you look at it from an efficiency perspective, effectiveness perspective, do you, as a mobile operator, really want to sign up 850 different bilateral agreements <laughs> with 814, 50 mobile operators out there to do this, or do you go through an IPX provider like us yep. uh, to manage a majority part of it? If you come to a mobile uh, IPX provider like us, where does that encryption, decryption take place? Mm -hmm. At what edge layer do you hand it off? Mm -hmm. Do you trust your IPX provider to do this for you, or you say because security is, is intrinsic to 5G, I want to do it on my own. So there, uh, without getting into any discussions, if, if you look it up, uh, the difference between what we call TLS and Prince, P-R-I-N-S, not the, not the Prince, the singer, uh, that discussion is a huge discussion right now between mobile operators. Uh, do, do we want to make IPX providers just a transit layer? Or do we really want to make them responsible for, again, managing the security and bringing the value add solution on top of it? So these are the discussions that we have never been part of. I mean, 4G just didn't require these type of discussions, and 5G does, and it's very, very complex. Right, OK. Thank you. Yeah, Ray, I mean, you manage different Gs in your network, I guess, don't you? How do you, do, do, why, is, why do you regard 5G much more complex, and how do you cope with it? Well, cl clearly, uh, you know, when you look at 5G, it's a complete technology ecosystem. Yeah. You know, there's, there's physical infrastructure, there's equipment, there's software later that ties it all together. So it's clearly more complex. In our role, though, we're, we're really an underlying infrastructure provider, so we provide the underlying fiber of data centers and siting solutions. But we do operate, uh, we, we've begun in the past year to operate our own network. And, we, and it's a, it, we're providing a neutral host service. Today we're doing it as a, as a uh, citywide, uh, specifically in New York City, Wi-Fi provider. Mm. So we own thousands of access points. And we, pro we provide 
um, you know, free Wi-Fi, but we also provide mobile roaming, offload services, and pri private uh, networking opportunities across that infrastructure. And we started with, it's a Wi-Fi infrastructure, happens to be the only uh, public Wi-Fi in the streets of, of Manhattan. Um, but we are looking at other, now what, what's the evolution here? We're gonna go to, wi we're Wi-Fi 6, we're moving to Wi-Fi 6 now. Um, 6E and 7 are in the future, but we're also looking at other technologies um, um, to operate, and it would be a 5G infrastructure relying on a technology like CBRS, for instance, and we're looking at small cell deployment across our footprint um, to, to operate. But today we have the, uh, you know, somewhat easier job of providing siting for the big mobile operators to site their gear, but I expect companies like ours that own this pervasive infrastructure, you know, we have 14 or 1,500 route miles of network, um, thousands of sites uh, connected, or thousands of vertical sites connected to, to our fiber, and 50 or so data centers in the region. I expect companies like us will start owning and operating the RAN networks mm -hmm. more often, and we, rather than, than um, selling space for a carrier to put a radio, we'll sell packets to them, mm -hmm. right? We'll create a, uh, a spectral sharing environment mm -hmm. where we, um, uh, actually control the RAN, and, and companies in our space are, 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 seem to be evolving in that direction. So. Okay, James, what's your take on this? Well, I, I think uh, everybody up here has made some really good points. Uh, I have a, a, maybe a couple of different um, additional points. Uh, one, of the, one of the items or the challenges that completely surprised me on this 5G transition was the virtualization of the core and deploying the, uh, I, I will say, the desire to deploy cloud native networks. Uh, that, had, that, that had never been done before, obviously. The technology really wasn't there. Uh, EPC is a great core, uh, but it, in many cases, wasn't virtualized and, and was very single vendor. So this virtualization, you know, 5G started with NSA, non-standalone. It evolved to SA. SA really, uh, standalone was really the evolution that enabled uh, the ecosystem to be created with companies like Google and Amazon and Microsoft Azure being able to play in, in, that, uh, in, those, in that ecosystem and those opportunities. Uh, but think about that. Instead of a, a sing, single vendor to do your, you know, your deployment, your testing, your verification, now you're relying on this wider ecosystem, and I'm not even talking about open RAN. Mm. And it's, it's not just the verification that the core network is actually working, it's that it is performing from a data throughput perspective, uh, but also uh, from a, a latency perspective as well. Uh, that has been a challenge that I, 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 don't, uh, I don't know maybe that many, many companies uh, and folks out there really appreciate that. That's a very difficult challenge. Uh, one other point uh, I want to make in terms of the challenge is, you know, 4G was largely deployed on spectrum below two gigahertz. Uh, a lot of, you know, the, uh, the initial 5G rollouts, there was even some millimeter wave. And having uh, a deep background in RF and RF technologies, I can tell you that millimeter wave deployments are very challenging. Uh, millimeter wave uh, technology is also very challenging, uh, but you know the promise of millimeter wave is quite intriguing. Uh, so it's not only just the millimeter wave, but even in the United States with the C-band deployments, uh, the spectrum is increased by 2x, or, or the frequency range, uh, you know, from 1.9 to 3.8 roughly. Uh, the propagation of those networks is, is really cut in half. It's a linear, it's a, a fairly linear equation. So that, so the, the channel models, uh, the way the network is deployed and operated, you know, for a long time for the prior generations of 2G, 3G, and 4G, all that, uh, the channel models, the data that was collected, a lot of that could be reused in 4G not so in 5G. So I, you know, I just thought I'd highlight you know, some of the challenges in terms of the core technology in 5G, really audacious, uh, but the benefits of, of a virtualized core 
are you have flexibility and you have scalability, which, which really weren't there in prior generations. Ray, you mentioned Wi-Fi a minute or two ago, which sort of takes us on to the next point that we were decided to talk about. What is the relationship between Wi-Fi and 5G? Or is it just they're coming along at the same sort of time and therefore people don't necessarily, people associate them together, but they're fundamentally different. And maybe from things that people have been saying just in the last few minutes, they are quite fundamentally different. Ray, go on. Sure, sure. When I think of this, I think of um, three different relationships. One, one relationship is the uh, Wi-Fi can be an underlying RAN for a 5G. Eventually, you know, we, that, that may work. Um, the, the, the other, so 5G over, wi uh, over Wi-Fi effectively. Um, but the, the ways that it's used today, and they're more, more so complementary. Mm -hmm. um, and if you imagine when, when you're out in the uh, public right of way, you're on the streets and you're connected to the 5G network, you, 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 you get home, you walk into your house, you switch over to your Wi-Fi network and you, your, your calling is happening across the, the, uh, the, you know, your carrier calling is still happening. But when you're, when you're out and you're using the 5G protocols, you, you know, you're, you're making no, normal uh, phone calls, you, you get into your house and you're doing a, VoIP, a voice over IP call from the house and they're complementary, right? They, they, they work together. Um, and there's been a real step change in the quality of voice calls over the last few years through, through this, these new technologies, haven't they? Sure. Well, yeah. certainly the uh, voice over IP yeah. technologies have gotten better. Um, but the, 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 other, the other, the inverse uh, interesting thing, when you look at uh, the 5G, 5G broadband connectivity to your home, a fixed wireless connection to your home connects to a Wi-Fi, uh, it connects to a router and, and on the other side of the router is your Wi-Fi network in, in, mm. in your home. So now your Wi-Fi is carrying your IP traffic, hitting and, and rather than going out over a cable network or a fiber optic network, it's going out over a 5G network, connecting to a, a local, you know, could be a macro tower, could be a small cell that's in, in your neighborhood and close by. We, so those, those are the three relationships I see with Wi-Fi and 5G. And a, again, I see them more as complements than competitors. I, 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 see, I, I don't see the layering with uh, 5G over Wi-Fi being, being much of an, anything, um, but it, it, it certainly is possible. And I, I know there's like WBA is working on um, standards for this, but, it, but the, the, the long-term view I have is the Wi-Fi 6E 6 and Wi-Fi 7 are going to offer similar um, uh, capabilities to 5G. We'll see things like quality of service, class of service. We'll see the ability for roaming to work real well. And we operate a public Wi-Fi network. You know, again, we have a couple thousand access points. We're growing this, our plans grows to 4,000 in New York City on the public right away. They're all fiber connected. They all have um, uh, uh, gig, gig or greater capabilities with the access points, and we have uh, uh, you know limitless backhaul because they're all fiber connected. Um, uh, and we expect roaming Wi-Fi. You know, as we evolve these Wi-Fi technologies, or as they get evolved, we'll see um, carrier service like or carrier service like quality uh, quality of services. Um, across the Wi-Fi network like we're seeing on 5G or, or certainly close to it uh, on our free Wi-Fi. Nicholas, does that just add, Wi-Fi just add another layer of complexity to what you're trying to do at Deutsche Telekom? Uh, it, it certainly does, uh, but uh, again, looking at it um, from a roaming perspective, yep. uh, of course, um, for us, uh, I mean, when you, the complexities are, our work in progress right now in terms of how it's going to work out again for us as I said as a as a global provider of roaming enablement this seamless experience when it comes to be it 4G to Wi-Fi or 5G to Wi-Fi as you travel yeah. is a major concern area for us in terms of how we make sure that again that uh, experience of a customer does not change when that individual leaves the boundaries of his or a particular country. Yeah. Okay, so that, that's a major issue in terms of how we create that seamlessness. Um, we are also one of the largest 
providers of Wi-Fi roaming today on aviation. We, we have uh -huh. major airlines that we serve as Deutsche Telekom Global Carrier in the world who are using Wi-Fi on the plane. And if you are using that today, um, hopefully when you're on our network, the experience is fantastic, no, no, but, uh, but the experience is not easy. It's not seamless at all. Yeah. So now we are looking at how 5G can create uh, a kind of a Wi-Fi, uh, uh, like cellular roaming yeah. activities on the plane. So we can use Wi-Fi and cellular roaming, 5G roaming, to give the, uh, the customer a better experience. Absolutely, wow. to, yeah. to give the customer a better experience on the planes. And so, we backhaul either satellite when you're over the sea or perhaps to Yes, absolutely, I mean, <laughs> absolutely, <the> absolutely. <laughs> and if you, want to more, if, you, if you want to learn more on the technical side of it, my colleague Ralph is sitting there and we can <laughs> definitely provide more information on it. But yeah, but, but these, are, these are areas that we, we are working on and, yeah. and we need to uh, be quick in terms of how we're going to implement these. Uh, and the same thing happened, again, I'm, I'm just giving an example on what's, what happens on the airplane, but uh, when you look at it from a different perspective as well, now we are talking about net network slicing, we are talking about campus networks. Um, so in terms of how that spectrum is going to change, uh, and, and again, I come from a commercial background, so the other part of it is I believe that the commercial models around 5G and Wi-Fi handover on 5G, we are still struggling with figuring out how we are going to create a commercial model that makes sense for the customer, right. and of course makes sense for us to provide that yeah. solution to the customer. So that's also another element, which is not the technical element, but it's a very important element at the end of the day. Okay. Yeah. Jonathan, what's your... I, mean, I can comment from a... I, I think they're both complementary, right? So. Yeah. With, with post-COVID uh, work conditions, everybody's working out of the house, they're using cable as their primary, but it's still a spot, right? Single point of failure. So more people are using 5G MiFi devices for, mm. for backups, right? So if you're on a Zoom call or you're on a Teams call and you're in your, 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 your Cox Wi-Fi or Comcast Wi-Fi has a DDoS attack or is congested or falls, um, it automatically reroutes through your 5G MiFi device. So I think, I think they're, they're very symbiotic. I think more and more consumers and business is are using uh, both as tools to mitigate single points of failure, whether they're at home or in the office or a combination of both. Okay, thank you. And uh, James. Yeah, again, I, I, uh, since uh, really good answers, I'll, I'll give you a, may, perhaps a slightly different perspective. Uh, you know, if you were to look on paper and you looked at the 5G, 3GPP spec, you look at the physical layer, you look at layer one to layer three, versus, you know, uh, Wi-Fi, Wi-Fi 6, Wi-Fi 6E, you say, hey, well, these, these look really similar the, in terms of spectral efficiency, data rates, latency, yeah, they, they look really similar. I can tell you uh, that one of the biggest differences between Wi-Fi and cellular, not just 5G, is testing. Every, uh, every cellular handset that's out there goes through a rigorous round of tests for compliance, conformance, performance, you name it. You know, it, it is, uh, the infrastructure equipment is, uh, is also exposed to that uh, similar level of testing. Wi-Fi, not so much. And when the pandemic hit uh, about, what, two years ago now? Uh, it seems, you know, time, time sort of evaporates <laughs> in the last well, two years. Well, my last day in the office was the 13th of March, 2020, <laughs> so, yeah, I remember it well. <laughs> but almost every service operator that provided Wi-Fi service, they were hit with service calls out yeah. the roof. That's a fact. It went, it went up exponentially because these devices weren't tested as rigorously as cellular devices. So what's changed? What's, what's happening now? So, uh, you know, we have a Wi-Fi business as well. We do Wi-Fi device testing. The broadband forum was uh, the first wi wireless standards or bro uh, broadband standards that, pour, uh, that put forth standardization in terms of compliance. It's not, it's not compulsory by any measure, uh, but it was the first one. Uh, there, are, there are proposals uh, being 
finalized in uh, the Wi-Fi Alliance, Etsy, among others, uh, to basically prescribe you know, performance testing for, for devices. And th that includes access points as well as UE or, or client devices as well. I think, uh, you know, what Ray said, I think was very, uh, very real and, you know, I, I, I totally agree with. But in, in order for Wi-Fi to even be somewhat competitive uh, for some of the applications that 5G, there has to be a similar level of testing. It's not, it can't be like it was in the past. I remember when I bought my first access point, it was like, well, what did you expect for 99 bucks, right? <laughs> so it's got to be a level above that, and I, and I think it will achieve that. Slowly but surely, I think Wi-Fi will get there. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, as you see, there's a Slido uh, QR code there for you. So if you scan that on your phone, you can ask questions. They'll be totally anonymous, unless you want to put your name on. So please do. We've got about... 10 minutes left, a bit more. So there's a couple of questions. We'd love questions from you about the, the, the topic today. Um, we've talked about 5G in different sort of applications. It seems to become um, almost a universal solution to everything. You know, 5G for rural op operations, 5G in dense urban operations, 5G in buildings, and I suppose we should to add private 5G networks on everything from you know, oil production platforms to factories making cars and things like that. And I know um, there's a, quite a bit of that in Germany, isn't there? Of, uh, a couple of private 5G networks used, are being used in, in car manufacturing. But, you know, is it, what, what, how do you make sure that, you know, all these networks operate to, in different applications, uh, work to good standards, they all interwork where necessary. Um, yeah, Nicholas, you go. Um, and when some of them are safety critical. I mean, if somebody's yeah. using 5G, private 5G for an operation, yeah, you're absolutely. I mean, works. <laughs> uh, I think the uh, the great thing about this is that it's going to be. I mean, network slicing is is a very good example of it in terms of uh, it's it's very adaptable to the use case. Yeah. And that's what I personally like about 5G. It's very adaptable to the use case. Um, for, uh, for a healthcare organization that is doing uh, surgery on a patient, mm -hmm. uh, you're not gonna need the same level of latency that you might need for a SIM card that is in your refrigerator that mm -hmm. has to send a message every month to say, you know, I need service yeah. or whatever. Uh, or maybe having a SIM card in your refrigerator uh, that, that does that every month, and then another one that says, oh, uh, you are out of uh, milk and you need to refresh it, because that you don't need. You're not going to... You're not going to wait a month to get that message. Or to so it's all this box of chicken you put in your freezer. Yeah, exactly. I hope, yeah, I'm sure it's going to get to that point. It's going to get to that point. The autonomous uh, uh, driving vehicles yeah. is another. So it's it's all about use cases, and I think when you look at the three different frequencies uh, that that we have today in terms of ultra low latency uh, and enhanced latency and so forth, I think it gives 5G gives us enough breath to say, okay, depending on the use case, um, we will have different network slicing activities that will manage that, that, uh, that particular use case. And again, commercially, price accordingly, mm -hmm. because we are not gonna provide the same price for a service that requires instantaneous feedback versus something that requires every six months sending a message. So from that perspective as well, the commercial models will be very different as well. Right. Ray, I mean, you look at networks doing all sorts of these, all of these functions, possibly on rural. I guess you're, there's not a lot of greenery, there's not a lot of rural areas in your territory, is there? But all the others you probably cope with. I mean, how, how do you cope with 5G for all these different situations? Well, again, our, our, our focus with the, the 5G rollouts that we're doing is, is really focused on bringing capacity to the street level. So yeah. we're doing a lot of small cell deployments on structures uh, like like light poles, traffic signals, and we just introduced a new a new uh, product to our, our, our set. We we uh, we, we uh, partnered up with uh, Link NYC, 
It's a, uh, a kiosk on the street that does advertising, has a, a portal for, uh, you know, a tablet for uh, 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 public access, and it, and it has Wi-Fi access points. We're, we're rolling out a new new product called Link 5G, which is a, it's a it's a kiosk smart pole, right? It's a 32-foot uh, structure that sports multiple um, uh, multiple technologies mm. and uh, multiple tenants on the same structure uh, throughout New York City. And it's a it's a new product that we're actually rolling out. We were just approved last last uh, December um, mm. on, on the new structure. So. Um, we're, we're again focused on that street level public right of way, uh, bringing capacity, and that means density every block or every two blocks or every three blocks of structure to create these small cells, right? Um, yeah. uh, like up Fifth Avenue and up Broadway to create a continuity of coverage um, uh, at that level. So it's, you know, we look at the small cell deployments in that dense urban environment as a, it's capacity multiplier. So every, if we put 10 cells out there, you know, we've mm -hmm. taken that same capacity and multiplied it by 10 times, put 1,000 out, we get 1,000 times more capacity of the 5G network. So that's what we've been focusing on. And, and okay. you're right, there is, but there is a lot of, you know, we are in, in um, New York City and it's not just all tall, shiny skyscrapers, right? We have a lot of beautiful parks and, and uh, residential areas that we're also right. Of providing course, these yeah. services to. Uh, Jonathan, you, you said earlier about, you know, not making sure if you've got a cloud-enabled, cloud-based network, you don't want to backhaul it all the way to a data center in Dallas if you're in you know, Washington, I suppose. <laughs> I mean, so that means there's probably a learning curve over the next few years of how to optimize your network performance for all these different applications for 5G, is that right? Yeah, I mean, it, it really depends on where your data is, where your applications reside. I mean, if you yeah. need to run active active replication, you need to be within five milliseconds or 100 miles of your compute. Yeah. Um, so we're seeing this repat repatriating of, of certain public cloud loads that sit in the various CSPs at the local level to um, increase performance. And obviously 5G kind of extends that edge capability. We're seeing computing power there in the, each local network. Correct, yeah. whether yeah. it's hyper-converged infrastructure, bare metal as a service, storage as a service, but you know the point is you, you want that compute as close, or, as close to the users as, as physically yeah. and logically possible. Um, so that's, that's kind of what we're seeing. The, right. um, and then obviously the, the, the hybrid um, connectivity with multi-cloud makes it more complex. So there could be some applications that work really well in S3 and, and, and rural Washington State, but the, the mission critical uh, um, applications that, that are time sensitive, yeah. that require four milliseconds to run properly, need to stay close to the users. And, 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 and James, I guess at Spiron, you, you different sort of testing regimes for different sorts of applications, is that right? That's right. I mean, they're all uh, going to be reliable and you know, <laughs> meet yes. all those five nine standards or whatever. That's correct. Uh, so yeah, we, we work with, uh, as I mentioned, uh, you know, the top service providers uh, in the world uh, as they're deploying their, their 5G networks. Uh, we test the core network. We test each individual uh, core network function. We also do end-to-end -end testing from the user device all the way to the core up through the application layer. Uh, I did want to circle back on your question uh, about the rural networks. Uh, I think one of the challenges with rural networks, obviously, that's not densely populated. Uh, I think these guys, you know, their business models perhaps are really focused on those more densely um, populated uh, urban areas. And, and, you know, one of the challenges with 5G for urban de or rural deployments is the fact, well, they're not densely populated, but the frequency ranges, the, again, the frequencies that have been allocated uh, for 5G uh, make it, you know, make that signal fundamentally doesn't propagate as far or as wide as, uh, say, 4G or, or some of the some of the other, you know, lower Gs. Even so, those trees get in the way sometimes, yeah, don't they? <laughs> that's right. So that that's a little bit of a, a conundrum. Yeah. Uh, I know in the United States and the current administration is really looking at ways, you know, t t to not mandate but perhaps provide you know, internet access, broadband internet access to uh, a really a largely, um, you know, rural, rural uh, uh, areas within, within the United States, as well as urban, and we'll see, we'll see what happens, but, the, but to illustrate the fundamental challenge is, 
you either have to have you know twice the investment in infrastructure equipment to cover that same geographic area just in terms of propagation yeah. or you have to roll it back uh, to a lower frequency and deploy uh, new, you know perhaps at a lower cost okay we've got a question in from a member of the audience uh, how, how mature are 5G SLAs and are they set by operators or do enterprise customers get the same going beyond best effort? Nicholas, <laughs> you are looking as though you're looking <laughs> welcome. No, it's, uh, uh, first, of all, first of all, 5G um, SA, which is uh, standalone, the SLAs are not mature. Uh, okay, let's put it that way. Um, uh, and it's not going to be, the, it's not going to be best effort. Okay. Right. Because again, this, and, and when I mentioned about network slicing, that means that the consumers, enterprise customers, would have a say. Yeah. Uh, even individuals uh, would have a say in terms of how much, what they need, what they want to pay, and what are the requirements. So from that perspective, it creates more of a collaborative mm -hmm. way of working with your customers, which is great, which, you don't, which we don't have today uh, in, in, in the other Gs. 5G brings that on board, but in terms of maturity, we're not there. As I said, the mobile operators and GSMA are working very, very closely to get there. Hopefully, by the end of this year, there will be a lot more progress on the SLAs, um, but that also depends on various elements that are not identified as of yet, such as the security aspects that I mentioned earlier with respect to things like uh, SEP and stuff like that that are still work in progress. What's the pick up the standalone and non-standalone uh, question? Is there any difference between the deployment of standalone and non-standalone 5G in terms of efficiency and SLA? It's quite a complex technical question, but if one of you would like to have a go. I, yeah. I, mean, I can go take ahead. a shot at it and go if you ahead. guys, you know, in terms of uh, NSA, non-standalone, that uses, uh, you know, 4G technology as the, uh, as the backhaul or the back end. And, uh, you know, one, the, the promise of, of, of really 5G is standalone. Mm -hmm. uh, that's where uh, the network, the physical layer, the upper layers, they have been optimized to deliver, you know, optimum throughput in terms of uh, data rates, uh, but also uh, latency as well. And, uh, you know, the SA is also where this virtualization, cloud native deployments, where uh, operators have uh, great flexibility and scalability uh, can happen. So uh, in, in terms of, you know, if you think about NSA in particular, it, it, it really heavily relies on 4G. You're not, you're getting faster data rates, but you're not getting all the other benefits uh, of 5G. Great, thank you. Well, this is, I think, the first real 5G conversation we've had at ITW, although it's been, of course, a little interval since we were last able to meet. I'm sure next year we're going to be talking even more about the experience of 5G and the difference it's making to the industry. So I'd like to thank Nicholas and James and Jonathan and Ray. I've got those two in the wrong order. Nicholas and James and Jonathan and Ray, thank you very much for your contributions. A really good discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Alan, for the moderation, and Nicholas, Jonathan, James, and Ray for your time and sharing your expertise with everyone today. Once again, I'd like to thank all of our sponsors for their support. Of course, without them, it's not possible to run this. Um, that's it for content today, but we do have a jam-packed social agenda this evening and moving into the night. So please find a location to perch up with drinks. We do have a cocktail night with Console Connect at 5.30 on the Orchard Terrace. So thank you all, and take care.